Okay, I've just gotten the information that the recording has started, so I would just stay, I would say we get started with the session. Uh, so welcome everyone to this virtual ICSI session on verification and validation. Um, we have six papers in this session and we will run them uh, in the same format that most of the sessions are going, I believe. We will do five-minute presentations in the beginning, just going through all the papers. That sometimes is a bit awkward, but that gives us an entire block of, of 30 minutes to discuss the papers. Um, if you have questions, you can write them in the chat at any time, and we'll get back to them. And ideally, you write uh, to whom the question is, to which paper or to, to which speaker, um, so that we can uh, make it easier associating then you can also raise your hand i actually haven't seen how i how that shows up on the screen but i believe we'll we'll figure that out so if you want to ask in person that's of course also nice um so those are the rules for here um and i will be chairing this session i'm, I'm grisha liebel i'm an assistant professor in reykjavik in iceland so very far up north and it's a bit too early right now but that's all for me. This this session is not not so much about me. So let's let's start with the first paper. Um, and the first speaker is Ralph Hoch, and the paper is verification of consistency between process models, object life cycles, and context dependent semantic specifications. Please go ahead, Ralph. Okay. Thank you. So hi everybody. Um, my name is Ralf Hoch. I'm a researcher with the Technical University of Vienna in Austria. And today I'm going to talk about our journal first contribution, uh, where we deal with different kinds of models and how we can connect them together and verify if these models are consistent with each other or not. Um, just to give a short overview of the problem statement and uh, set the scope of the work a little bit. Um, we are specifically interested in cyber physical systems and specifically the ones where we have some sort of process engine that drives the overall system. So for example, uh, if we consider uh, a charging operation for an uh, electronic car, then first we have to insert our credit card, we get authorized, then we can connect the charging cable, then the voltage can be applied so that the car is actually charging and then the charging process starts. So here we have a very process-oriented, task-oriented view on the overall system. So we have always some sort of action that alters the state in which the system is. And that's typically one, one view that's very common with cyber-physical systems. On the other hand, however, we typically have artifacts that we operate on. And these artifacts commonly are designed by a different process designer, by a different person. And uh, in these artifacts, we actually model uh, what kind of attributes and what kind of object life cycle these uh, artifacts have. So for example, in our, in our e-charging example, we could have uh, our car as, a, as an artifact. And this artifact can be in several states. For example, the charging cable can be connected. It can be ready to take voltage. Um, it can be charging. And so different kinds of attributes can be set and they might have to be set in some sort of order to, so that we don't uh, violate any, any restrictions that we have on these artifacts. And one of the questions that we are interested in, in is how can we bring these different kinds of things together? So how can we bring the process-centric and the artifact-centric, so the complementary view on this overall system together and how can we formally connect them? And after we have established this formal connection, how can we use it to check and verify if these two models actually fit together? Formally. And here we are interested in basically in two questions. Um, first of all, can the process always continue with a next action? So can we always reach some sort of defined state? Essentially, don't we get stuck along the way? And the other part is, um, can the artifact or the object lifecycle that we have in a given state always handle the action that the process is trying to execute? So for example, we cannot start charging when the cable is not connected, for example. And these are the two questions um, that we defined to, for consistency between these models. 
And our proposed solution is that we want to use semantic specifications to bring these models together. And these spe semantic specifications essentially model what one action of such a process does. So it models what, what has to be fulfilled before we execute this action and what needs to be, uh, or what's ensured after we have executed it. So essentially pre and post conditions. And these pre and post conditions, um, we formally ground them using uh, first order logic in our extended object life cycles in the artifacts. So we establish a connection between our pre and post conditions by grounding them in these artifacts, and then we're using these semantic specifications and annotate the tasks in our process model. And this finally brings these two models together, and then we can perform a consistency uh, verification between the process model, the artifact lifecycle, and our semantic specifications. And then we check if the, all these models and all these parts actually fit together. We have defined an overall workflow for for this verification approach. Um, so first we start with simple models that can be given in, for example, uh, let's say for the process centric part of the system, it can be PPMN or uh, UML activity diagram, something similar. And then we use model transformation to incrementally uh, extend these models. So first of all, we add the annotations through our semantic specifications. Then we transform the model again we combine it with the object lifecycle and that bring everything together into a single single model. And then we use this model to transfer it to finite state machines so that we have uh, a valid input for our verification tool that we use, which is essentially model checking using new XMV. Um, and we generate source code for new XMV through model to text transformations. Together with this source code and our consistency criteria, which we see down here, which uh, relate to the two criteria that I uh, mentioned before, which are here given in linear temporal logic, um, both together we plug it in into the model checking tool into new XMV, and then the model checking tool tries all the combinations and checks if there are some violations regarding these two consistency criteria. If we have any problems, then we get a count example and we have to fix and find out how this problem did arise. If there is no problem, then we have a guarantee that we are consistent, consistent between the model regarding these two criteria. We have already used this approach in several research projects and now also with industry partners with some larger scale uh, cyber physical systems and uh, have received good results. Um, there are still some limitations to our approach specifically when, when it comes to concurrency um, in within projects and uh, parallel execution of different kind of paths in one process. Uh, and that's also what we are currently working on. So that already brings me to the end. Uh, it's a very short overview. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, refer to the paper or to Wait. the presentation online. And if you have any questions, you can always just shoot me an email and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ralph. Um, then we directly go on to the next, and that's Gitam presenting verification of ORM-based controllers by summary inference. It's visible, eh? Sorry? Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible. It's just not in presentation oh, mode yet. But... Oh, now it's fine. Yeah, right? Perfect. All right. Uh, okay. Hi, uh, I'm Geetam and I'll be talking about uh, verification of ORM-based controllers by summary inference. Our goal is to infer functional specifications from ORM-based controllers. ORM is essentially a programming technique that the application developers use to interact with the underlying uh, database in an imperative fashion. Our functional specifications capture one, uh, values for the model attributes, that's the data presented to the end user, and second, the database updates. Let's take an example. Let's take a look at an example controller. So in this controller, we are iterating over uh, this user payments table. And in case this condition ID equals the incoming parameter default payment ID matches, we set the default field of uh, user payment to true. In the other case, we set it to false. And in both the cases, we save the iterator back to the database table. In this case, uh, our approach will infer the specification that the updated value of this user payments table 
is union of these two relational expressions. In the first one, uh, the ID matches this default uh, payment ID. And in the other case, it doesn't. In the first case, we project the true value for the default column. And in the other case, we'll project the false value. An application of um, these summaries is verification of a single controller. So consider this example uh, property, which says that no tuple in this updated uh, value of user payments table whose ID did not match the incoming parameter should have its default field set to true. In practice, we verify these properties by uh, offloading the verification conditions to alloy. Our approach to capture these summaries broadly proceeds in two steps. First is conversion of code to a relational algebra based IR, and second is conversion of loops to relational expressions. Let's take the same example. This step is sort of a rewrite step in which we rewrite each of the statements such that their RHS is a relational expression. So for example, in this statement, user payment list gets all the tuples in user payment repo. Therefore, we will rewrite it to say that uh, user payment list equals user payment repo. In case of loops, we'll preserve the header and we'll rewrite its body to equivalent conditional expression. Uh, next, we convert the loops to relational expression. And in this case, we'll rewrite the loop such that it says that the updated value of user payment repo is its initial value minus user payment list and then union of uh, the relational expressions that we just saw. How we actually do this translation is through a pattern based rewrite system. These are essentially rewrite rules. And as with other rewrite tools, they have a pattern LHS and a pattern RHS. Both of them are essentially relational expressions, except they can also have these meta variables in angle brackets. How these meta, variable, uh, meta variables get their values is when we match the pattern LHS with the result of uh, step one. Okay, we proceed with the matching and we fill up these table that gives uh, the values for the meta variables. Okay, and then we plug in the values of the meta variables in the pattern RHS and which gives us the summary for uh, user payment repo that we earlier saw. You can also use this summary to uh, check property of traces. So consider this workflow that in an application you created a user and then you went through a bunch of uh, let's say unrelated controllers and then you tried to look up that user that you created uh, by say its last name. Uh, now, interesting property that you would want uh, the application to hold would say that if you created a user and then you try to fi uh, find that user, then it should show up in the results. How we actually do this uh, trace property checking is through these two formulas. Uh, this is the base case uh, and this is the inductive case, but I will not go into the details of these formulas or uh, why this is correct. For the same, please check out the paper. Uh, we implemented our approach uh, based on DBridge, which is a work by Imani et al. at Sigmund 2016. Uh, they replaced loops with equal and SQL. That's more performant. On top of it, we add several features necessary to check uh, functional properties. We did our experimental evaluation through the help of uh, a bunch of student volunteers. And it consisted of these six open source web applications. Our results were fairly encouraging and a large chunk of the property fell into the true categories. We also did our mutation study and which demonstrated that our tool is fairly able to catch bugs in case they are present. We compared our approach with uh, Java Pathfinder as baseline and while JPF also correctly uh, classified 16 assertions at passing, it required significant manual effort to convert spring controllers to pure Java. To conclude, we propose an approach to capture functional specifications of ORM controllers, a pattern-based uh, loop rewrite system, uh, then an approach to check trace properties and implementation, and finally, an extensive evaluation consisting of uh, single controller properties, trace properties, baseline comparison, and a mutation study. Thank you. Thank you, Gitan. Um, and because I haven't mentioned it yet, so all the first paper was a journal first paper, but all the other five paper are on the technical track. Um, so Ralph had the extra challenge of presenting a long journal paper in five minutes. Uh, great. So let's continue with paper number three, and that's uh, wrong.
implementing RefD, refinement types for valid deep learning models. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, my, my title is... Uh, Hey, okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's, uh, it's my turn. Or... Yeah, it's your turn. Exactly. Uh, my paper title is not. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Then just uh, yeah, tell us what your paper title is when you're ready. <laughs> my title is Data German. Yeah, uh, sorry. Learning. Uh, okay, okay. Yes, I get sorry. Uh, I dropped one line. My my confusion. <laughs> so yeah, it's wrong, <laughs> Chen, and it's a different title. Sorry. <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Rongchen Xu from Tsinghua University. I'm glad to show our recent work on program termination analysis. The termination is a crucial liveness property for a program. A lot of work has been devoted to the analysis of program termination for a long time. However, termination analysis is still challenging. The data-driven method has been applied to many fields in recent years and has shown its unique advantages. In recent work, we attempt to integrate data-driven approaches with the termination analysis. Look, look at the right program with a single loop. In the loop, the variable x keeps increasing when it is less than 10. Otherwise, it will be raised to zero. Obviously, the program is always terminating. But how can we strictly prove it? For all input x, we can find that the loop must iterate no more than m equals minus x plus 11 or 1 times before finishing. We call such the m a loop bound for the loop. This is a math framework of our approaches. Initially, the default loop bound m equals zero and the data set h is empty. In the analysis, we will generate a verification task for current loop bound m and check whether it is valid. If current loop bound m is valid, we can report the program terminates. Otherwise, we can produce a config example during the constraint solving and uh, update the data set. Yeah. Then we can learn a new bound and re repeat the procedure. There are two crucial problems here. One is how to learn a loop bound, and the other is how to check the loop bound. We will fur further discuss them in the following slides. We use a random test to generate the data for the bound learning. During the test, we collect two kinds of in information. One is x. The program states at the loop head. The other is IDC, which represents the remaining number of iterations before the execution terminates. Thus, the loop bound learning problem is to find a loop bound candidate M such that for all data in data set MX is greater than or equals IDC. In all in our paper, we proposed three kinds of loop bounds, including simple loop bounds, conjunctive loop bounds, and lexicographical loop bounds. In this presentation, I will introduce the first two bounds briefly. Suppose the current data set for the right program is the triangle nodes. We can apply a simple loop bound learning here. Simple loop bound learning is an optimization problem. The optimization target has two terms. Recost makes the bound result closer to the data points, and the M cost makes the form of the result more simple. However, one simple bound may not fit the whole data set tightly. Thus, we propose the conjunctive loop bound learning to learn more local features. Our conjunctive bound learning will use a clustering algorithm to convert the problem into several simple bound learning problems. Bound learning, let's consider how to validate the bound. Given a program and its bound candidate, we first transform the bound validation task into a safety property problem. For example, we inserted the red card in the original program. Then we made a bounded model check and based quick bound check, that is, unrolling the loop k times and checking whether the bound is fresh. 
the quick bond check can help us falsify an incorrect loop bond in a short term. Finally, we use a safety checker to generate an environment and exhaustively prove the loop bound. Note that our environment synthesizer is also data driven, so we can share all the data between bound and the environment learning and make the termination analysis more efficient. Based on our approaches, we implemented a prototype tool called DDL10. We compare our DDL10 with four state-of-the-art termination analysis, analysis tools. Our DDL10 solves 136 benchmarks, and the average solving time was 5.43 seconds. In the figure of cumulative time for solving benchmarks, our DDL10 extends further in solving time and grows slowly in cumulative time. That's all of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thanks, Rongchen. And I'm sorry for the for the mix up with the title. <laughs> That's uh, but no now we continue. Uh, so now we get to the Refty paper, and that's uh, Yan Ji presenting okay. that one. Let's okay. let's try okay. that again. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will introduce uh, our recent work, Rafti. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yanjie. Uh, I will introduce Rafti refinement types for valid deep learning models. Uh, deep learning models provide many uh, configuration options for users to tune. For example, the hyperparameters. Uh, user can tune this CN model, uh, convolutional model. For example, it contains many uh, subgraph configurations. Uh, this one, user can tune the kernel size. Uh, each node represents the kernel size of the count 2D. Uh, the red one represents the user tune the hyperparameter and uh, train a new model to get better learning performance. A uh, user can also tune the neural architectures, for example, the subgraph uh, structure. Uh, we called it a neural architecture search. Uh, but uh, uh, during this process, a uh, user may meet many type errors of deep learning model. Type errors is similar to the traditional program's uh, definition. Uh, for example, the program's uh, constants, variables, and methods uh, error behavior. Recent impure studies indicate that type errors of DR models are not uncommon. For the uh, first uh, related work, uh, uh, it shows the uh, incompatible tensor shapes. The second is from the industry uh, impure studies, also show the tensor mismatch in the largest class of DRC specific job failures root cause. Let's see an example. Uh, this is a deep learning model defined by the PyTorch framework. Uh, this will trigger an illegal shape error. The root cause is that the kernel size of operator average put to D is too large. So that the height and width of the output tensor will be negative and trigger a runtime error. Type errors of DR model is very important. Uh, it can save significant shared resources uh, on platform, uh, boost development productivity, uh, reduce failures uh, for deep learning training jobs, benefit automatic tools to improve search efficiency. Uh, but uh, it is very challenging. Uh, first reason is that the hybrid program paradigm adopted by their frameworks has the internal computation, not like the traditional program uh, language for C++. Uh, there exists a large number of possible hyperparameter combinations and neural architectures. Uh, we summarize the common type errors of deep learning models. It contains two large dimensions, uh, for example, the hyperparameter error and the tensor error. Uh, hyperparameter error contains the illegal value, improper value category. Error contains four categories, unsupported format, illegal shape, incompatible shape, and uh, incompatible element type. So we propose uh, we propose Revty, uh, refinement types for valid DR model. Uh, Revty refine each operator with logical formulae that describe the computational requirements on both tensors and hyperparameters. Uh, checking the validity of a model is reduced to a constrained satisfaction problem. Uh, Revty utilizes SMT solver to obtain the unsatisfiable hyperparameter values before job execution. Uh, we also uh, show an example of the refine type of a Metamol, uh, the matrix multiplication operator. Other operators uh, will listed on the paper. 
uh, the P1, P2, and the P represent the constraints for the input out, uh, input and sensor constraints. For example, the element type constraint, uh, the shape constraints. Uh, we also build the Rafty as a tool. Uh, Rafty will accept the computation graph model specification and tool specification as input. Uh, it will traverse the computation graph following the operator execution dependency to generate a set of constraints that the DR model should satisfy. We also evaluate the Rafty effectiveness on individual DR operators and uh, real-world deep learning models. Uh, we also evaluate the e efficiency in constraint solving comparison with relative work of Pythia. Uh, we use a precision recall and a speed up to measure gravity. Uh, first, uh, let's show an example uh, for the evaluation uh, on the real world DR models. So we tune the hyperparameters and the operators. Gravity uh, achieves 100% precision recall in the, all the experiments, confirming its effectiveness. Uh, we also compare gravity with uh, the static shape checking tool, Pythia. Uh, Pythia is a uh, shape checking tool uh, detects incompatible shape errors for TensorFlow uh, Python programs. Uh, RFD still achieves 100% precision and recall, although precision of Pythia is 100% 12.2%. Uh, next, I will summarize our work. Uh, we have presented RFD, a frame type based approach for statically checking common type errors of deep learning models caused by tensors and hyperparameters that violate the computational constraints. We demonstrate that RFT is very effective to detect potential type errors before job execution. Thank you. Thank you, Yanji. Um, so that was paper number four, I believe. Uh, yes, and next up we have Harrison Green uh, on fuzzing, graph fuzz, library API fuzzing with lifetime aware data flow graphs. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Harrison and this is GraphFuzz Library API Fuzzing with Lifetime Aware Data Flow Graphs. This is work I did at For All Secure along with Thanasis and I'm really excited to be able to share it. So the problem we're trying to solve is how to automatically test APIs. And in this work, we focus specifically on C++ APIs like this example here, but a lot of the ideas generalize to other types of APIs. So a well established uh, automated testing is fuzzing. And the idea with fuzzing is you basically create a wrapper function like this fuzzme function here that takes in a big chunk of data and does something with it. For example, maybe it calls a parse image function. And the idea is the fuzzer will invoke this function millions of times with different data to explore the space of your target. Um, but a lot of APIs, for example, the C++ library, uh, don't have a nice convenient entry point that accepts a big chunk of data. And instead what we're interested in is testing the interaction between many small functions. So how can we do that? Well, the main idea with graph fuzz is to represent API interactions as data flow graphs. So in this graph, vertices represent API endpoints, in this case functions, and edges represent objects that are passed between endpoints. So created by some endpoints and consumed by others. Uh, in this case, we have a method on the canvas object. So as inputs, we need a canvas object and a point object. And after we invoke this function, those, uh, we can reuse the canvas endpoints. They would also be outputs. So you can imagine converting your whole API surface into a set of endpoints with expected inputs and outputs. For example, here we have a canvas constructor that produces a canvas object. And similarly, we have a canvas destructor that consumes a canvas object. And so with this representation, the problem of generating a new test case becomes how can we link together a bunch of these endpoints so that all of the edges are connected and the types match properly. So an example of a complete data flow graph representing a single API interaction is shown here. On the right, we have our graph representation with vertices and edges. And on the left, we have equivalent C++ source code. Notice how on the right, all of the edges are fully connected and the types match properly. Additionally, with this representation, we automatically enforce proper object creation and deletion. So we can be sure that we're calling our canvas constructor before invoking canvas draw point, 
And similarly, after we invoke that, we can be sure that we're properly calling the destructor. This representation also allows us to perform high level structure aware mutations on the test case sequence. For example, here we've added three new functions and we've properly linked it into the graph. On the left, you can see what the equivalent change would look like in the source code view. Um, importantly, GraphFuzz can perform this mutation and execute the resulting API test case without recompiling anything. And this allows us to efficiently mutate the API sequence and test it during fuzzing. During our research, we applied GraphFuzz to a bunch of open source libraries, and we found bugs in nearly all of them. So here are four examples of crashing test cases that we found with GraphFuzz. Skia is the graphics library used in Chrome and Android. RDKit is a cheminformatics library written in C++. And SQLite 3 is a database library written in C. Uh, it's worth noting that all three of these libraries have been fuzzed very extensively, and yet GraphFuzz was able to target new API surface and find new bugs. So using GraphFuzz is fairly straightforward. Uh, the first step is basically to create a schema, which is written in YAML, and it contains basically a list of all of the objects and methods that you want to test. Uh, for the majority of the time, you can actually just list the function signature, and GraphFuzz will automatically infer the expected inputs and outputs. In some cases, it's necessary to be a bit more explicit about that. And so we also have a more verbose endpoint definition format. Uh, you can look at our pre-recorded uh, presentation or our documentation for more details about that. And then using the schema, you use the gfuzz command line tool to automatically generate harness files and then compile them with Clang using the fsanitize fuzzer flag. This produces an executable that you can run to start fuzzing. Um, as a bonus, because GraphFuzz uses libfuzzer under the hood, the generated executable is a native libfuzzer binary, so it will automatically work with any fuzzing as a service infrastructure like OSS fuzz. And finally, GraphFuzz is completely under an MIT license. We've included a bunch of Docker images with all of the fuzzers we built during our research, and we've set up a website with all the documentation and a bunch of introductory tutorials to hopefully make it easy to use. Um, contributions are welcome, so if you have uh, questions or ideas for improvements, please feel free to open an issue or submit a PR. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Harrison. Uh, now we are five out of six talks through. It's also good to see that the, the room is a bit fuller and we have the first questions in the chat. If you have any questions, please post them there. Um, but for now, we have paper number six, and that's uh, Yi Liu, and the paper is Morist, model-based RESTful API testing with execution feedback. So at least we're staying on the API level now. Please go ahead. OK, OK. Hello, everyone. I'm Yi Liu from Nanyang Technological University. And I'm going to present our work about RESTful API testing. This work has collaborated with our industry partner, Huawei. So cloud computing plays an important role in current cloud platforms. Therefore, the robustness of cloud computing services is critical. Bugs may lead to cyber attacks, which cause financial losses. First of all, let me introduce what is a risk for API. A risk for API means a constraint of risk style. So currently, risk for APIs are widely used in cloud services. So one of the challenges in risk for APIs testing is how to infer API calling sequences from open API specifications. For example, how can we get these calling sequences from its specification? We proposed a solution named RPG based on the property graph. We encode uh, response schemas and the operations into it to solve the uh, coding sequence generation. So this figure shows the detailed workflow of Morist. First, to test the risk for service, Morist first takes its open API specifications as input to build the RPG. And after building the initial RPG, Morist uses is to generate coding sequences and replace the API calls in the call sequences with actual requests. Then the generated test cases are fed to the target risk for services and Morris shall collect the responses. By analyzing the collected responses, Morris reports the detected failures for bug analysis. 
Moreover, Boris also used the responses to refine the RPG by adding missing ages and move, removing infeasible ages. The refined RPG is then used for generating more test sequences. With the open API specification, Morris can build the initial RPG consisting of nodes and edges together with their property or labels, which may contain false edges or misses on edges. So here we introduce how uh, Morris to use RPG to generate test cases. In general, this requires two steps. First, Morris to traverse the RPG and aggregate visited operations from uh, coding sequences, and second, Morris generate concrete input for the APIs in the sequences to build test cases. We generate parameters on the fly by these three ways. So the initial RPG generated with open API specification may contain errors. Uh, um, while doing the testing, new ages are added to our RPG when we find new dependencies. As for the uh, age deletion, this operation is recognized as infeasible after several tries. We aim to answer the following research questions with the evaluation. First, uh, the code coverage of Morris. Second, the bug detection of Morris. And finally, the RPG guidance and the dynamic RPG updating with the performance of Morris. So Benchmarks contains six several, uh, services from previous work. We use three state-of-art black box with for service testing techniques as baselines to study the performance of Morris which include Ristler, Rist, Gene, and Evil Master. So according to the data, Morris achieve better code coverage and robustness in most cases. Besides, Morris achieves the best performance in bug detection. So RPG and dynamic updating enhance the bug detection and coverage of test case generation. So finally, we proposed Morris a model-based black box with for API testing technique. And Morris learns from the open API specifications to build a RISD-for property graph. Finally, Morris can use RPG to guide high-level guidance for code sequence generation and refine the RPG with execution feedback. So that's all of my presentation. Thanks for your listening. If you have any questions, I'm very glad to answer it. Thank you very much, Ji. So that, uh, just to make sure I'm not getting it wrong. No, that brings us to the end of the presentations. Thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot to all the speakers. And we jump right into the Q&A. And uh, there was a question from Gitam to Ralph or several questions, so maybe we start there. Um, what are what language are the process models specified in? So those uh, cyber physical system processes, how do they how are they specified? Yeah, um, typically they use uh, different kind of of models or languages that we use um, for the overall specification of the system. We typically use uh, SysML. Um, so that's, that's the overall system that we describe it. So there we describe uh, requirements, components, how they are all related to each other and connect with each other. Specifically, the process models that we used, uh, we did use UML activity diagrams, um, but we did also use uh, PPMN diagrams for more business-oriented software. Uh, so there is more software, it's not a cyber-physical system, but their PPMN is commonly used. And uh, we actually support both of these approaches with uh, uh, both these languages with our approach. Mm -hmm. um, as at, for at this level, I, I was wondering, um, because I don't think you mentioned it in the talk now, to, to what level is your approach specific to certain notations? Like what notations do you support? Or is it agnostic? Um, no, a specific 
uh, notations that we use are the UML activity diagrams and PPMN, so the business process model notation. Mm -hmm. These are the two specific uh, models that we use, um, or notations that we use. Um, there is, of course, an option to use a more abstract process description language, uh, process calculus, uh, something similar like that. But for actual models that we create, it's always uh, UML activity diagrams or PPMN. Okay. okay. And the other uh, part of my question uh, was that basically, like, what is the use case of uh, your work? Now, I'm kind of assuming from what you said that it's actually uh, kind of a debugging like design issues. So before you actually go ahead and implement the system, you kind of uh, like exactly, you yeah, um, yeah. I was I was just getting to that part. Um, uh, there, there are different kind of use cases. Um, typically, we we try to use it uh, beforehand, before we start with the implementation. So it's the overall design of the system, um, and we want to make sure that everything fits together. And then the, at the implementation of the actual services. So uh, all these all these tasks that we have in our process model are then represented by implementations uh, given as services uh, that we can call. Um, and these services also have to adhere to uh, the specifications that we have, so essentially the pre-imposed conditions, and there can be uh, some relationships and uh, abstraction within these semantic specifications that we have. Uh, so uh, we, we we can apply them in different kind of contexts. We can enhance them depending on where they are used, um, and we ensure this by using a subtyping relationship between the, the task in the process model and the actual service implementations that we have. So typically, as a use case, we do it beforehand before we start implementing. Uh, but very often, it's the case that there is or there already exists some sort of implementation, and uh, we need to. To enhance it with models because everything is only implicitly given in the source code and no explicit models are available. And uh, what what companies that we are working with are commonly trying to do is to extract all this knowledge and have some sort of representation in in a model form. And and then we start uh, backwards. So <laughs> we have the source code, the models are created, and then we see if everything fits together. So that's actually the more common use case that we have, uh, but we actually designed it to be the other way around. OK, great. So I mean, can you also uh, kind of disclose like, which kind of clients are you working with in the industry? Um, you mean uh, in which kind of domains we are working uh, yeah, in? Yeah, and I mean, yeah, maybe okay. if you could also say the companies, I mean, yeah. OK, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I can mention the companies. That's that's not a problem. Um, we have a, a couple of industry partners in the automotive industry. Uh, for example, we are working with together with Bosch, and we are working together with Siemens, for example. Um, so that's two uh, larger companies that we are working with. Uh, other companies are more local uh, in uh, the Vienna region, um, so smaller companies. But these are the two uh, big ones. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Ralph. And maybe then we directly continue from Ralph's question to to Ron Chen. Uh, you, maybe you just uh, discuss it directly, but I don't have to read it. I think that's yeah, of course, nicer. Yeah, of course. Um, in in your talk, you mentioned uh, that you randomly generate test cases and inputs for your loops to uh, to then generate the data that you use to to identify the bounds. So I was wondering uh, how you make sure that. Uh, these test cases, or that you can find some sort of class with how, how many kind of test cases do you generate, and couldn't there be some sort of code analysis useful to do beforehand so that you have an idea where your test cases or some of your uh, inputs are so that you have a better idea how, how you get the bounds? Uh, yeah, the test case, uh, we use a random test. Uh, the we, uh, first the program is relatively simple in our benchmarks. So the uh, the, the, the the test is uh, uh, relative, uh, relatively uh, uh, cover all the possible execution traces in the program, and uh, uh, thus we can make a. Uh, 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 can, we can get the most information of the program uh, from the uh, the test uh, information we then guess a bound and uh, uh, to check the bound and uh, uh, 
yeah, uh, this is uh, the main procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 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 essentially, you're looking uh, at the code, uh, all kind of different paths that you could take. Uh, it's it's more like like a white box testing that you're looking at the source code and then you're trying to find all the paths. Then you generate the the inputs for them. If I get yeah. that correct. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And then Harrison had a question to Yenji. Yeah, he answered in the chat, but I can. Uh... Discuss this well, oh, yes. Harry's uh, the topic, uh, the question is a, a very important topic. Uh, so, uh, once uh, Raft is about uh, has supported the operators, and uh, we also do uh, operator reduction because for the activation operator, uh, they will share the same rules. So, for new operators, uh, user need to refer the source code or fast testing to add uh, new rules to the uh, tool. Uh, so it will pay some effort to that. Uh, mm -hmm. But this also uh, has a very uh, can be auto extract or generate uh, the rules. So we recently uh, have a co cooperation with other colleagues. So we try to uh, use data driven or the uh, PR technique to extract uh, but uh, this is ongoing. We think that is very difficult to achieve 100% uh, precision. Maybe it can um, extract some simple rules to help us. So currently, this is this problem's status. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we generally see this a lot. And yesterday also in, in the other session I was chairing, the, the first verification and validation that a lot of the approaches still require you to, to manually formulate first order logic, specifications, or all these kind of logics that in practice are often quite tricky for the engineers to do, right? So yes, that's, yes. that's a major yes. issue, how to, how to at least partially automate that. Yes, yes. You spend many manual effort. And some colleagues say, oh, I can't accept that. But we, we <laughs> say, oh, this is the truth. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I have a question to Harrison. Um, so it's an interesting idea to kind of put these different API calls together. And I was wondering, the, the example you made was this one of the classic libraries. You have canvas, you have points. And in a way, I, I remember working with, with C++ computer graphics. And you could figure out many of the APIs by just looking what goes in and what comes out. And of course, that's, that's why your approach works. But I, I was wondering whether you have any any ideas or experience for what kind of APIs this approach works particularly well? Uh, because I, I could imagine, on the other hand, for example, what, what G was presenting, if you test the REST API, of course, that pretty much everything is generic. The same goes in, the same comes out, whatever you do. So what, for what kind of APIs does this work, or for, for which ones is it not well suited? Definitely, yeah. So the uh, API showed in the example from our experience with trying to test Skia, which is one of the, the main libraries we were testing. Um, I, I think in general, the uh, improvement you get using graph fuzz versus a traditional fuzzer is really when there's a library that doesn't have that nice entry point for you to fuzz. So, so things like graphics libraries are things where, you're, uh, where it's possible to invoke many different functions in different orders. Um, those are really the targets that we, we think get a lot of improvement from this. Um, and, and actually with, you were mentioning um, just being able to sort of like infer the API by looking at what the function signature is. Um, we do have actually some experimental work uh, using Doxygen to parse the source code for a library and then try to automatically generate a schema. And we found that this this works for like 90% of the functions that you pull out. And then sometimes you get weird cases where it's like a void pointer or like an array argument. And you sort of have to like go in and manually tell the computer what, what those are supposed to be. Right. Okay. And I mean, I'm going a bit out on a stretch because I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but th this remind, I mean, this approach of, of plugging together, the, let's say the different API calls and in a way getting a graph reminded me a lot on the early uh, mutation testing approaches for like websites and so on, where you basically build a graph and then try to, to mess around with that. Do you have any, uh, any ideas in, in that direction or is that you feel that it's a completely different area since you're mainly concerned with fuzzing, I suppose. Um, yeah, so it feels to be honest, like if you're already, yeah, sorry. 
Uh, yeah, I'm coming more from a security background, so the, the mutation testing is a little bit outside the field. I, I think one uh, one area that's potentially interesting is when you sort of pair this uh, API like plug and play aspect with coverage guided fuzzing. You can use feedback from the target to decide which API sequences are sort of interesting, and then you add those to a corpus and you can mutate them. And there's definitely a benefit you get from being able to get this coverage feedback. Mm -hmm. Okay. May I um, add to this point for, because I was yeah. going to ask something about the, and you just mentioned it, the, the data flow graphs that you have. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering how you actually construct the graphs and uh, if you, what kind of tools you're using uh, to extract all this information or is all done with uh, or self-implemented. So I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So the, um, the schema is sort of the, the definition for the graph. And this is the, the part that the user creates when they're writing the fuzzer. And it's definitely the most uh, time intensive part for like testing a new target. Um, in terms of graph generation, we basically split it into two pieces. So the first piece is we have a bunch of sort of predefined mutation rules. This is sort of typical in fuzzing. You'll define a list of like possible mutations. So these are things like we'll swap out an endpoint for one that has the same inputs and outputs, or we'll like randomly remove and this leaves the graph in like a, an incomplete state, potentially missing edges. And so as a second step, we have this, uh, we call it the edge completion algorithm. And what that basically does is whenever there's a missing edge, we replace it with a subgraph that generates that edge or consumes that edge. So for example, if we're trying to call a canvas method, but we don't have an input, well, uh, this edge completion algorithm could fill it in with a canvas constructor. And uh, in some cases, you actually need to fill it in with multiple endpoints. So if you think about like the factory model of like object-oriented programming, you need to like create an object, which then creates a different object, which then you can use. So occasionally, the edge completion algorithm will actually fill it in with like a sequence of APIs. Thank you. That's very interesting. OK. Uh, do we have any, first, before I go in and ask another question, do we have any other questions by, by people so I don't block them? So I want to have a question for Green. So do you consider about uh, refine your graph during testing? Because initially you may have a very uh, relatively simple examples to fuzzy. Uh, so after several rounds, you may have some uh, domain knowledge about say uh, libraries and then you can uh, generate more complex uh, fuzzy template to uh, further boost the fuzzing process. Yeah, so um, this was definitely uh, something that was uh, we were thinking about during the research. Um, so I noticed reading your paper, I really like the aspect of actually modeling, figuring out um, things that might not be correctly defined in the original schema definition. Um, in our case, the, uh, the fuzzer is really uh, relies very much on the schema being correct. Um, so we, we see, for example, in a graphics library, you might have a function that takes a float parameter that's supposed to be like an alpha channel. And so there's an assertion inside that function that says, is this between zero and one? And if not, it throws an error. And so uh, especially when we're trying to automate pulling out these functions, we can fuzz these functions, but then we end up you know, throwing floats in that immediately throw assertions. And so I think there's a lot of potential for um, doing some experiment during fuzzing. And if we consistently see that an endpoint is crashing, we can try to reason about what are the inputs that make it not crash and possibly just remove it from the schema or try to update the schema. But that's definitely uh, future work. Great. Uh, I have a question to, to Ralph um, regarding the, the specifications. Um, and I mean, my, my background is also in the automotive domain. So I've seen a lot of what, they, what some of the companies are doing. And it's the, the cases I've seen, it's rather rare that you have sort of complete models of everything. So I, I was wondering what's the level of, of completeness that you need to look at that your approach makes sense. You need to have like a model of a, of a subsystem, let's say that is, that is reasonably complete or, or where else of the, what is necessary? Okay. Um, for, for the approach itself, um, the, the consistency that we are trying to verify, of course, just depends on the completeness. So if, if the models are incomplete, the verification would still succeed, but 
we might miss something then. Um, but as you mentioned, typically the, the models are, or the models, the systems are really, really complex. Um, that's why we are focusing on, on smaller parts, subsystems. Uh, so for example, with, uh, with Bosch, it's in the automotive industry, but it's uh, specifically for uh, controlling devices of, uh, uh, of, of the car. So it's not the overall system, it's always specific functions that we have. So for, for example, an automated cruise control or something like that. Mm -hmm. There, the models need to be for to have it really. Uh, uh, it, it, it's it's hard to say, but uh, you, you cannot guarantee that that the models will be complete. Our approach cannot uh, yeah. ensure that. So that's that's a validation problem. And in the end, and then that depends on the overall specification of the system and the requirements. So if we have all the requirements, then the system should be complete. But typically, it's it's smaller parts that we are looking at, and these should be defined in a yeah almost complete way so that we have can make any uh, statement about it. Okay, but it's I mean it's at least feasible that you say okay you have you mentioned cruise control you have a safety critical function and then for that one you do a reasonably complete model and uh, consistency check. Yes, yes, because they typically have um, if if you go down the levels and you get really to the to the technical details of, of single components, then the models typically are, are pretty pretty good, uh, even if they're not do not exist in a in a model based form, but more uh, within documents and specifications. Uh, uh, and then these models need to be created according to these specifications and need to be complete and uh, fit these specifications, then we can make a reasonable statement about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Then let's, let me have one last question for, for Yenji for the deep learning models. Um, you had this comparison in, in your evaluation to, to Pythia that looked very impressive because you found 100% of these uh, shape violations and Pythia only, I think it was 23. And I, I was wondering, I don't know Pythia, so I, I, yes. <laughs> I'm not that familiar with that, but I, okay. I was wondering to what level this is a fair comparison. Is, is Pythia also relying on some kind of specifications or is it an automated tool that just automatically that, tries to find these issues? Okay, I think uh, this is uh, uh, the technique uh, uh, doing at uh, which layer, uh, Pythia tool and also have two other related work is like a Python method because they uh, do the checking in the Python layer and uh, use the parser to define, predefined API uh, extraction rule. So they lose, uh, just like the first challenge, the hybrid programming model, they lose the right. deep learning model computation graph structure. So they only extract each input output tensors violation error. So um, we uh, observe that, so we need to uh, dump the deep learning model's computer graph and do the checking on the whole graph, so to check more errors than the traditional method. Right, okay. okay. So it's basically that they are on a, you could say, on a different abstraction level where they cannot find certain things because the information uh, is not there. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it's the um, Python uh, or the parser limitation, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I do think we're, we're pretty much done with the time. Uh, I would very much like to thank all the speakers. This, this was great fun and very interesting talks. And with that being said, uh, a round of applause and enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.